Welcome to this first session of our virtual four-week workshop on Maris spirituality. During this session, we're going to look at spirituality over the course of life. We're going to look at some of the challenges personally, interpersonally, and spiritually that people face early in life, during the middle years, and later in life. And then we're going to wrap it up by looking specifically at three stages of spiritual growth that take place during each of those periods. Let me begin our session with a story. It's a story about a seventh grade class waiting outside the cafeteria to go into lunch. And as they stand there, the teacher who's supervising them takes a look at the group and she counts the number of students. And then she looks into the dining room or the cafeteria and she sees on the serving table a large plate of apples. So she goes in and she counts the number of apples also. Then she took a piece of paper and she wrote a note and she placed the note on the plate of apples. And her note read, take only one. And remember, God is watching. Well, there was a little boy in the same line, and he looked further down the serving table where there was an enormous plate of chocolate chip cookies. He read the teacher's note, and then he wrote a note of his own and put it on the plate of cookies. And his note read, take as many as you want. God is busy watching the apples. Now, what's the point of the story? The story is about perspective. When we look at the life cycle, that's the way we have to look at it, from a certain perspective. When we look at spirituality, it's the same as true. What I'd like to do in this first session, then, is look at spirituality from different vantage points in the course of life. First, the early years of life, when we have what's called essential discipleship, and we'll explain that in a minute. The middle years, when we have mature discipleship, and life's final years, when we have radical discipleship. This will help us set the stage for what lies ahead in the course. Let me start with some questions. And for a moment, think personally. Have, have you ever found yourself asking questions like these? Where am I going in life? Where am I headed? Or how am I using, or even more striking, wasting my gifts and talents, living out or betraying my dreams? A very poignant question, whom do I care about? Does anybody really care about me? Or a question that kind of pulls them all together. If you and I were to die today, what in your life or my life would be left unlived? If a storm came ripping through wherever we are in a few minutes and took us all off to the next world, the history book is written. Those things we've done or carefully recorded, those that we plan to do are not recorded. What in your life or my life would be left unlived? I'd like to suggest that the heart of these questions lies a spiritual question and really the question that lies the heart, at the heart of the meaning of life, on whom or what do I set my heart? The Christian gospel stated it about a treasure in a field and what price you pay to get that treasure. But keep this phrase in mind as we move ahead. Now, if you and I were to take the course of life, an average life, and chop it up or divide it into four periods, we'd come up with the first, which is infancy, childhood, and adolescence a second, early adulthood, a third, midlife, and a final, the late years of life. Infancy, childhood, and adolescence runs from the time of birth up until about the late teen years. And the message during that period is growth, change, and development is expected, anticipated, encouraged. We talk about developmental lags if a child doesn't do something at a certain age. If you've ever taught primary school, you know that kids are growing perceptually terms of their motor skills, et cetera. And during adolescence, young people are growing spiritually, physically, interpersonally, sexually, dynamically. Now, until recent years, most people thought that most growth, change, and development took place in the early years of life. And that somehow around age 20 or 21 or 22, a curtain fell and we had a fully fashioned adult, well able to handle life's challenges. That's simply not true. Most of the growth, change, and development that takes place in the course of our life takes place after this first period, and mainly because we have the ability to reflect on our lives. So let's look quickly at each of them. Early adulthood runs from the late teen years. It overlaps with the first stage of life up until about the early 40s. And this is life's most difficult chapter, most trying chapter. And that's because there's a period in early adulthood called novice adulthood, which runs from the late teen years till the early 30s. And during that period, quite simply, we're learning what it means to be an adult. The dilemma is most of us feel like we're imposters when it comes to adulthood during that period. 
We walk, talk, act, and interact like adults, but we're convinced that somehow we're going to be found out. When I, that we simply don't know what we're doing. When I was a young teacher, for example, the first parent-teacher session, I looked much younger than my years, so I dressed as conservatively as I could to look as old as I could. That night I was in the guidance office and when a middle-aged married couple came in to talk about their son. And they said, we'd like to speak to Brother Sean. And I said, yes. And then there was this pregnant pause. And then the mother of this boy repeated the question. She said, we'd like to speak to Brother Sean. And I said, that's me. Then she asked the dreaded question. She said, how old are you? And I thought she's probably saying to herself, I've got kids home older than this character. Who is he to be advising me about my son or daughter? So the early years of life are challenging years. And we'll look at some of the tasks that are involved in them very shortly. Midlife and life's afternoon is potentially life's best chapter but it's also the chapter in which we face the issue of personal mortality. The poet Dante said it well. He said, in the middle of the journey of my life, I came to myself within a dark wood where the straight way was lost. Ah, how hard it is to tell of that wood, savage, harsh, and dense. So bitter is it that death is hardly more. Death, mortality. Many people looking at those lines from Dante would say today, Perhaps he was reflecting on his own midlife transition and life's second chapter. In the middle of the journey of my life, I came to myself within a dark wood where the straight way was lost. This period of midlife runs to the early 60s when the late adult years get underway. And the late adult years run from early 60s till the end of life. And during them, we really build on what's gone before. The late adult years are years for giving thanks, for nurturing the next generation for coming to be at peace with ourselves and our life, to be able to say eventually, if I had the same life to live over, I'd do it again. And I, including I'd make the same mistakes because they've helped me to make the person that I am, in fact. Now, how do we move from one of these chapters of life to another? Well, we do it by moving through two different uh, times. One is stability, the other is transition. Think about yourself for a moment. A stable time in your life is not a stagnant one, but it's rather one in which you're building a life for yourself. Your sights are set on the future. For example, you get out of college or school and you take up a job and you are becoming independent. Maybe there's a great deal of excitement and energy. You're looking towards the future. And these periods often last six to seven years on the average. They're periods of great dyna uh, dynamism, great energy, great hope. And our task during any of these periods is to build a life for ourselves and to include in that life our goals and values. Transitions are very different. These are times for second thoughts in life, times when I look back on the last few years and begin to evaluate myself and what I'm doing with my life. Transitions usually begin with an ending. Something in my life comes to a close. It could be reaching a certain age. It could be an educational experience could be a spiritual awakening, the death of a parent, beginning a love relationship, ending a love relationship. Many things can trigger a time of transition, but it's usually an ending that does it. Now, I don't know if like me, but often I think, okay, something's come to a close, let's get on to what's next. With times of transition, that doesn't happen. Rather, what occurs is a rather prolonged period where you and I would feel a bit lost at sea or up in the air not really sure where we're going. An example of what it might feel like to be in the midst of a life transition. Suppose you're at uh, a lakeside one August afternoon in a part of the country where it gets very young. And you're looking around to see what you might do that could liven the afternoon up when across the lake you spy a sailboat. So you're a bit of a sailboat buff. You said, I think I'll swim over, check that boat out, and uh, I'll be back very quickly. But as you get to the shore to begin to swim, in the distance, you see something else that's very common on hazy, hot, humid summer afternoons, and that's the beginning of a thunderstorm. But you say to yourself, hey, look, I'm a strong swimmer, a risk taker. I'll be over and back before that storm moves in. So when you dive and halfway across the lake, your luck runs out. In other words, that storm was moving a bit more rapidly than you imagined, and you are now in the middle of a lake in a thunder and lightning storm. I don't know if I'd have the presence of mind to know what to do, but let's say you do. You say to yourself, I've got two options. I can get back to that shore that I just left and I'll be safe, or I can swim towards the dock and boat 
it was my destination and I'll be okay. But lo and behold, as you look back at the shore you just left, you discover now it's shrouded in fog. In other words, you can't find it. And that boat and dock across the lake, which was your destination, in the violence of the storm, it's broken free of its moorings and drifted to the other side of the lake. And there you are in the middle of a lake in a thunder and lightning storm with zero options. Some people say that that's what it feels like to be in the midst of a life transition. All you know is you cannot go back to where you came from, but you also don't have a clue as to where you're headed. Transitions finally come to an end when a new beginning gets underway, when a new chapter of our life starts to unfold, when once again we set our sights on the future. But remember, you can't rush a transition. Some feelings during the time of transition, we feel disoriented. We can't go back to what we knew. We're not sure where we're headed. We can be disillusioned. Things don't look as good. We don't look as good. Relationships don't look as good. Our life choices don't look as good as they once did. We also can feel disengaged a bit from life. I remember a woman friend of mine going through a transition said to me once, she felt as though she was sitting in the grandstand of life, looking at life rather than in, in the middle of it participating. And then finally, during times of transition, the familiar roles that we live out in life don't make sense anymore. And roles are important. It's the overuse of a role that's problematic. But during a time of transition, the roles that made sense to us and helped us to identify ourselves begin to lose their meaning. Now, a few facts. One, you cannot rush a transition. There's no express lane. You can't go and do a program somewhere during the course of a summer and get through it. Secondly, and most importantly, transitions are a normal and necessary part of what it means to be an adult. And finally, transitions offer us an opportunity for transformation, to reinvent ourselves. And that we have to do particularly when we reach midlife. This brings us just very quickly to a moment where we have to look at how we understand human spiritual and interpersonal growth. Some people have been given the rather strange notion that life is like a ladder and that we're climbing the ladder and if you don't do something at a certain step, in other words, if you miss a step, then you're frozen on the ladder. I don't think human growth occurs that way at all. I think human and spiritual growth is more like a spiral staircase, a circular staircase. We keep coming back to the same issues at different ages, at different times in our life and with different skills that help us to deal with them. So questions like identity, intimacy, meaning, we're gonna to have to face at 22 or 23, but we also have to face these issues at 30, at 45, at 70. So think about your life in terms of a circular staircase rather than climbing some sort of ladder. Final point here, before we look specifically at the different stages in a bit more depth, Remember to distinguish between change and transformation. Change happens at a point in time. I paint the wall. I put a new window in the house. Transformation happens over time. And transformation is something that happens to us personally. Uh, the seasons give us a sense of transformation. We move into autumn. We don't get up one morning and all of a sudden there's snow on the ground. The official view that people give about change, however, is that if change is necessary and explained carefully, we'll be able to handle it? Not true. Because planned change is almost as disruptive as unplanned change. And this is important when we look at the course of life because the change is unplanned. So if you're in the middle of a life transition and you're feeling uncomfortable, you've got a lot of company. Sometime later today, you may want to take a few minutes to look at this reflection question. It might help you to review a bit what we've just talked about. How are you different as a person than you were five or 10 years ago? And what gave rise to these changes? Go back five or 10 years and ask yourself, today, how am I different than I was back then? And secondly, take a look at the rewards and challenges of this period in your life. Every period has rewards and challenges. Try to understand what yours are at this particular time in your life. Now, moving on, I wanna talk about the first years of adult life. That's early adulthood. I mentioned earlier that it is the most stressful period during the course of life. And secondly, that the major task 
is learning what it means to be an adult. It's like you're in, in a school learning what it means to be an adult. We watch other people. We look for reinforcement. We test our skills out. We enter into relationships. We fall in love. We, all sorts of things go on. And we're learning through all of that what it means to be an adult. We make mistakes. That's true. But it's an important, essential part of the course of life. And there are four general challenges we face during this period. First, we have to form an identity. We have to answer the question, who am I? And then we have to cultivate intimacy in our life. Who am I to others and who are others to me? Thirdly, we need to begin to explore a life's work, a vocation, a mission. And finally, we need to find mentors, those human and spiritual guides who help us identify what's really important in our life and to give those aspects of our life a central place. What do we mean about forming an identity? Well, very simply, I said earlier, that to form an identity is to answer the question, who am I? And in order to answer that question, we have to do three things. We have to explore our options for living, try out different ways of being in the world. And the more we try our options out, the greater the crises, the crises of choice, because eventually we have to make choices and commitments. Now, if you've ever taught adolescents, you know that they explore many options for living, the way they dress, the way they act, the music they like, whatever. And that's an important part of adolescence and early adulthood. But let me give a concrete example that might bring this closer to home. Suppose you go out to buy a shirt or a blouse and you go to a store that sells only shirts or blouses. And let's say you've got $35 and you go in and you look quickly and you see a shirt or blouse that you like, it's the right size, it costs $35. You pick it up and you're walking to the register to check out when you see another shirt or blouse equally attractive, right size, same price. Let's say you've got 45 minutes and you're a bit obsessive compulsive like I am. So you explore the entire store, every shirt or blouse in the store. And you come up with 52 that you like equally well that fit each of them costing $35. The more you explore, the greater the crises because the time is going to come when you're gonna to have to walk to the register, put one shirt down, part with the 35 bucks and get out of the store if you want to complete your test. The same is true when we form an identity. We, ex we look at our options, we experience crises, but at some point we have to make choices and commitments. We have to say, I am this person and not a thousand other people I could be. These are my values and not all those other values that are out there that other people might hold. These are commitments that make sense to me, sense to me in terms of who I am, rather whether or not they make sense to other people. Now to just say, a bit more about that. When we're achieving an identity, what we're actually doing is breaking our psychological uh, ties to childhood and forming a separate and distinct identity. We're moving away from home, hoping to form a new home for ourselves. We start to seek internal affirmation, our own approval, rather than the approval of others. Sure, we don't want to alienate everybody, but sometimes we say, no, these are my values, or I believe this, or I'm going in this direction even in the face of opposition, because it has so much to do with who we are. We also then begin to structure our relationships based on these internal needs rather than the expectations of society. As we grow older, we find it's very boring to live, live according to the expectations of society. But early in life, it centers around our relationships. We form relationships based on what's going on inside of ourselves rather than what others expect of us. And finally, when we're achieving an identity, we develop a feeling of resiliency because we feel more at home in our own skin. We feel more comfortable with ourselves, our feelings, our sexuality, our relationships, our beliefs. Now, the second task or second challenge we have is intimacy. And at the very beginning in discussing this topic, I'd say we need to develop an understanding of intimacy much broader in scope than simply genital sexuality. We're, we live in some cultures today where people meet first in bed, and then decide whether they want to get to know each other. I'd rather define intimacy in a different way. I'd rather ask a question and say, do I have enough confidence in myself as a person? Do I believe enough in myself that I can risk closeness with you, that I can tell you who I actually am? So am I at home enough in my own skin that I can share myself with you? That's really what intimacy is about. Genital sexual intimacy is one type of intimacy but a much more profound type of intimacy 
is this sense of being at home more with myself to such an extent that I can risk closeness with you. Some of the defining characteristics of intimacy, and these are learned characteristics, they're not genetic. I have to have a uh, capacity to self-disclose. I have to be able to tell you who I am. And we do that, we learn that over time as we share ourselves with people uh, as we move through our adolescent e years and early adulthood. Secondly, for a truly uh, intimate relationship, there needs to be mutuality. Both people need to see themselves as equals. And that's why if someone's a teacher, they may form a teacher-student relationship with someone. And it's only later when that dynamic isn't there that people become genuine friends because they're equal, they're mutual in the relationship. If you're a teacher, you may still have control over someone's grades or whatever. And there's all sorts of mixed things that go on there. And finally, I need to be vulnerable. By that, I don't mean I need to be falling apart emotionally, but I need to be able to tell other people I need them. I enjoy their company. I wanna to get together. If I go out with someone just dropping a note or calling them and saying, gee, I had a great time, let's do this together. Once again, vulnerability. If I seem completely self-sufficient, then people feel as though they can't do anything for me. And it really interferes with any intimacy I'd have in my life. What is the most common form of intimacy in everyone's life? It's friendship. Friendship is the most common form of intimacy. You take a marriage. If you don't have friendship in a marriage, you don't have very much at all. So keep that in mind when you think about intimacy. It has so much to do with friendship and that, that wonderful gift in the course of our life. Now, the next area to look at is mentors. These are people that we need to find in the early adult years of life. They're neither parents nor peers, but a bit of both. These are men and women who help us to deal with the question of identity and meaning. And they also help to introduce us to aspects of ourselves of which we are unaware. There's an idea called the dream, that everyone in life has a dream, a dream about how you wanna live your life out, how you wanna change the world, all those things you wanna to do to make it a better place. Mentors help us to identify that dream those central values, and to give that dream a place in our life, a central place. Many mentors are spiritual guides who help us to look at God, belief, faith, and those elements and give them a central place in our life. And that brings us to this first dimension of spirituality, essential discipleship. Ron Rollhauser, who's an oblate priest, talks about three stages of spiritual growth. And the first he says is essential discipleship. It's associated with early adulthood because it's associated with that period in life where we struggle to get our lives together. Questions like identity, intimacy, meaning. It begins at puberty. We work when we work to separate from family so as to create a life and home of our own. If you're in early adulthood, think about the questions of faith that you have, not necessarily tied to organized religion, but questions of belief and who God is and how, how faith and values uh, affect your relationships, your outlook on the world. In essential discipleship, we struggle then to find ourselves, to get our lives together to create a new home. Some of, these el uh, of the elements of this struggle will continue throughout life. Now, we take a look at the middle years. I mentioned Dante before. He said, in the middle of the journey of my life, I came to myself within a dark wood where the straight way was lost. The central challenge of the middle years is facing personal mortality. That along with everybody else, I will also die. Now you might say, don't people in early adulthood, don't they um, know that everyone's gonna die? Absolutely, except they also believe that an exception will be made in their case. People in early adulthood feel invincible. At midlife, because of a number of factors, we look at personal mortality. One of the factors that we often look at is the obituary column or the death notices in the paper. People seem to be dying at a younger age. Have you ever found yourself saying, oh my God, 50, so young. Someone 25 doesn't think that way. Another factor is what do many midlife people talk about? Bran and the diet, losing weight, exercise. You don't hear 25 year olds talking about those sorts of things. Midlife, there's many factors that come to play that cause us to look at the issue of personal mortality. And perhaps the, the biggest one is what I refer to as a buffer generation. When we're in early adulthood and we look at the generation ahead of us, 
we say, well, those people buffer me from having to look at my own mortality. Say, sure, we're all going to die, but believe me, this generation just ahead of me, it's going to happen to you before it happens to me. What happens around midlife? There's a shift in the buffer generation. And people who were early adults now find themselves in midlife and find a generation behind them that is saying, yes, death will happen to us all, but believe me, it will happen to you before it catches up with me. During the middle years, we also bring together aspects of ourselves that have been in tension. All of us have aspects of our personality, our spirituality that contradict each other, that cause tension and anxiety within us. Midlife in the face of mortality, where we come to accept ourselves as we are, helps us to bring those uh, poles, those tense aspects of ourselves into union. And that brings us to this point. The greatest gift of midlife is self-intimacy. That I come to know myself, accept myself, and love myself in a selfless way. In other words, at midlife, we number ourselves among the population of friends that we have. And the third, the last task in the middle years is to take responsibility for mentoring the next generation. Biologically, mothering and fathering is the work, children is the work of early adulthood. Psychologically and spiritually mentoring that generation is the work of middle adulthood. And that brings us to mature discipleship. And with mature discipleship, I'm less concerned about what I'm going to do with my life and more concerned with giving my life away so as to make the world a better place. When I'm at home as with who I am as a person, when my values, my dream have a central place in my life, I really wanna make the world a better place. I wanna change it. I wanna leave it better than I found it. Secondly, the major questions in terms of spirituality at midlife are altruistic. How do I remain faithful to my values and beliefs? How can I, what can I do to sustain myself and my commitments? whether you're in a marriage or in religious life or single, how do I sustain myself in the face of looking at midlife aging? How do I reinforce, build up my commitments? How do I more effectively give my life away? And by that, I mean in service to others. How can I be less, less self-centered and more other-centered? Now, coming near the end of our presentation, life's final years. These get underway, I said, around age 60, 65, continue to the end of the life cycle. During these final years of life, one of the greatest challenges is to stay active and engaged in the face of some physical and psychological decline. As we get older, there is some decline. We don't have the energy we had in an earlier year, or those five pounds we, a year we've been putting on for the last 10 years is now 50 extra pounds of weight. We find ourselves sometimes forgetting things. People talk about senior moments. The challenge at midlife is to stay active, positive, and engaged in the course of all of that. And also to let go of a self-image tied to what I can do and em embrace a self-image that is more related to who that I actually am. When I get to the end of life, if I'm still trying to define myself and what I can do, then I'm in serious trouble. But unfortunately, our society does that. How many uh, people when they start to slow down or leave a job that they loved, how, how many feel lost because they've defined themselves in terms of their work rather than in terms of who they are. When we define ourselves in terms of who we are, it's a great gift. Also, during life's final years, we need to get out of the way and make room for the next generation. The last thing we need to do is hang around in leadership positions or in, in other roles that a new generation is eager to take and quite frankly, can do better than we can at that point in life. Final points, during life's final years, we need to give thanks for the life that's been ours. And to say, if I had to live it all over again, yeah, I'd live exactly the same life. I'd make the same mistakes, I'd want the same people in it, because all of that has helped me to become the person that I am here near the end of my life. The very final challenge of the final years is to realize that the late, last great act of obedience is letting go of life. And by that, I don't mean ending life or anything morbid, but being able to let life go so we can move on and embrace death. People who die a peaceful death are people who've been able to let go of life. And they're people who are grateful for the life they've had, but realize that now's the time to move on. With radical discipleship, this becomes the challenge 
in the late adult years. How do I live out my last years of life so that when I die, my death is as important to my loved ones as my life was? How do I live a legacy, in other words? People often leave legacies by putting their name on a building, but to me, to nurture other people, mentor them, help people to grow up, living legacies are much more valuable. And also, how do I continue to die to self and be alive, generous, and other-centered for others? Some older people become very self-preoccupied. How can I work against that? The poet Goethe put it well. He said, life itself will eventually force you and me to decide whether or not we want to become insane for the light. Whether in joy, at the end of our life, we can own it, let go of it, and move on. Thanks for spending this time together. I've enjoyed it, and I hope you have also. And I look forward to meeting with you again later this week for our live session online. Thanks again.